Great. Um, so thank, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'm very excited to be starting this project with you and so excited that so many of you are here today eager to preserve your collections. So I wanted to start off with a quick disclaimer. Um, while we will be heavily using the webinar format throughout this program, um, we'll likely be switching to a different platform, a different software provider soon. So if you continue on with us, which of course I hope you do, um, the next webinar you log into might be slightly different. Um, this platform will be okay for now, but it isn't ideal. There isn't really an active chat function on this particular platform. Um, and since a big part of this program is trying to get you guys more connected with your you know neighboring cultural institutions that's something we really want to make sure that we are able to provide with the webinars um, so today we can use kind of a limited chat function you can chat with just me you can send um, questions there's in your little control panel there should be a questions tab so you can go ahead and type in questions there um, to me and I will um, read them out loud so we can kind of work that way. Like I said, it's not ideal, but I think it'll work for this time around, and thank you for um, your patience while we figure out which platforms are best for us. So um, with that, I wanted to go ahead and jump into our program. First off, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Samantha Forsco, and I'm the Preservation Specialist here at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. Um, I will be the kind of lead in this region of um, the of this program, so I will be the, the face you see in in-person workshops and the voice you hear on the webinars. Um, so I'm looking forward to meeting all of you and in person and getting to know a little bit more about your collections as we go through this program together. So this program, the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program, has been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, NEH, as I'm sure most of you know, was founded in 1965 as an independent federal agency. It funds education, research, and public programs in the humanities. It awards grants in many categories, including challenge grants, preservation, education, and training grants, and digital projects for the public. Um, at the end of 2016, the organization that I work for um, was awarded with a nearly $400,000 grant to support its preservation field services program throughout 2017 and 2018. The bulk of this program is a regional collection stewardship program, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, we've been calling this program as a whole the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program. It doesn't make a great acronym, but RHSP um, will have to do. Uh, in the past, uh, my organization has led a very successful similar collection stewardship program in the Philadelphia area. So we came up with this by building upon that program. Um, and I'll let you know a little bit more about that program later in this webinar. But um, we have set out to lead a set of ambitious new strategies to serve regions of the country that have traditionally been, um, haven't had kind of collection stewardship training um, in the past. So before we get um, a little bit more into all of these details, I wanted to just pause for a minute and tell you about the organization that I work for, which is the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, um, or CCAHA for short. Um, it's located in Philadelphia, and we are a nonprofit conservation facility specializing in the treatment of works on paper, photographs and books, through conservation and state-of-the-art digital image services. Aside from the conservation work that we do, we have expanded to offer a variety of other services such as fellowship opportunities, fundraising support, and disaster assistance. The department that I work for, which is the Preservation Services Office, is the outreach and education arm of the organization. We present educational programs, conduct preservation assessments, and assist institutions with the development of many institutional plans, including collections management policies, preservation plans, emergency plans, and more. We serve nonprofit cultural institutions, private individuals, and other collecting organizations, both in our home state of Pennsylvania and kind of throughout our mid-Atlantic region, but also nationally as well. 
So when CCHA first opened its doors in 1977, it was a paper-based conservation lab. While we now offer many other services, which I'll tell you about, um, paper conservation treatment was kind of how we began. So if you're ever in Philadelphia, I would invite you to come visit our state-of-the-art lab and see our awesome paper conservators at work. We have conservators and technicians that will restore, repair, and conserve kind of anything and everything paper be that works of art, uh, books, documents, manuscripts, photographs, um, more historic documents like papyrus and parchment, um, and they even do kind of strange specialty projects like wallpaper, um, anything paper they will work on and they are great at it. But as I mentioned, we, we do a lot more than just paper conservation treatment. Um, we also have a custom housing and framing department so that we can make sure all of those carefully treated and conserved items can be stored safely in preservation grade materials. This department can also do things like create sealed packages so even if your framed item is submerged in water it won't get wet and will still stay safe. Stay safe. So really looking at preservation from all areas. Additionally, we have a digital imaging department that can help create facsimiles and reproductions. This can be really helpful for institutions if they have something that's maybe too fragile to exhibit or if they're concerned with other preservation issues like light exposure, for example. This can be kind of another route that institutions can take to um, still preserve artifacts. Uh, we also can um, help people digitally image their um, collections for collections documentation. We also make sure that we um, can document all the conservation work that we do with high quality dim digital images. And then lastly, there is my part of the office, which is the Preservation Services Department. As I mentioned before, um, this is the public outreach education wing of the organization. And um, we're also the part of the office that kind of leads outreach programs such as this one. Um, so I uh, do trainings, workshops, lectures, and conferences. I kind of am working to help bring preservation ideas and principles out of just kind of theory and things we read about in books into a form that's really usable for people who are actually working in the field. Um, I consult with institutions and do a number of assessments, make recommendations to how to improve collections care, as well as to help a lot of institutions with various policies and plans, um, some of which are listed there. Um, something I think that is really unique to what we do here in the Preservation Services Office is we really aim to provide realistic, um, meaning you know feasible with limited supplies, budgets, and personnel. Um, suggestions for implementation and recommendations. We also really value providing trainings and workshops, um, that hands-on component to give people the skills they need to actually follow through with a lot of the uh, implementation recommendations. <clears throat> So that's, you know, what we're hoping to be able to do with this program here in your region. So RHSP is happening in two separate regions of the United States currently. There's the Appalachian regions of Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia, which the Director of Preservation Services is the project lead in that um, area. You might also hear from her. Her name is Diani Faiga, so look out for that. Um, but then there's also you guys, which we're calling the Eastern Gulf Coast, kind of for, for lack of a better term. We don't have kind of a easy name like the Appalachian people do. Um, but we're focusing on the region that sort of encompasses the states of Alabama, Mississippi, and the panhandle of Florida. I've kind of loosely circled it here in this slide. Um, so these two regions of the United States were selected through consultation with the American Association for State and Local History, AASLH, um, as areas that have had historically limited access to conservators or other preservation experts. So this new outreach model will combine in-person education and networking opportunities, webinars, increased access to resources, preservation needs assessment, and a final conference in these areas to catalyze collection care activities in the regions, while also encouraging the development of a community infrastructure that will be sustainable. Um, the ultimate goal will be to link together a cohort of preservation partners to establish a long-term network um, for 
on the ground regional support in your area. So I'll go over each of these topics in a little more detail shortly, but just to give you kind of a quick bird's eye view of the RHSP program, these are the activities that will be included. There are the in-person workshops. Those are going to be occurring throughout the re region over the course of the next year and a half. Um, we're trying to spread out the locations as much as possible and doing each workshop twice at uh, different locations in each region. So hopefully everyone will have an opportunity to attend an in-person workshop that is relatively nearby to them. Of course, the other thought is that they won't be too inconvenient for, for anyone, so we might still be able to, to um, attend the ones that are a little bit further away. Um, during the months that we are not in the region doing these in-person workshops, we'll be hosting webinars on various topics to sort of supplement the materials from the workshop, as well as giving you an opportunity to connect again with your neighboring institutions in the region, see how they're doing, um, what they're working on, et cetera, as well as giving you an opportunity to um, connect with me again if you have any additional questions kind of crop up. And of course, you'll be able to email or call me whenever as well, but this will be sort of a scheduled thing, so it might be easier. Um, there will also be a grant opportunity for the, those in the region to receive an on-site assessment with me that will result in a written preservation needs report. Um, and then finally, we will conclude the program with a final conference. So um, to back up for a minute, I had mentioned in the beginning that we were adapting this model from a project that we had already done in the Philadelphia area. So I did want to tell you a little bit about the regional work that we have done here, how much it's benefited the region and why we want to take it to you. Um, the Philadelphia Stewardship Program um, is actually concluding this year. It's been running for 15 years, began in 2002, it was funded through the William Penn Foundation. Um, which is a local um, foundation that funds kind of regional initiatives. Uh, this program also sort of took a regional approach. We we're serving cultural institutions in the counties that surrounded Philadelphia, and that included even a county in New Jersey. So we're looking across state lines there as well. Um, because all of these institutions are so close together, even you know, regardless of what state they're technically in, we realized that they shared some similar issues that might be a result of regional needs. That might be weather and geography, um, you know, local funding opportunities, it could also just be the local culture, um, et cetera. So um, the need for such a program like this developed after some assessments and recommendations from local conservators. Um, they um, noted that Philadelphia area institutions were lacking in the necessary infrastructure um, to provide suitable collections care. Many institutions in this area lacked fire detection and suppression systems, security monitoring systems, essential policies and procedures, environmental monitoring programs, etc., all of which kind of make them vulnerable to catastrophic loss from fire, water, theft, um, vandalism. Etc. Um, the conservators really stress the need for preservation planning in Philadelphia's cultural institutions in order to ensure the long-term preservation of these important collections, but really stress that there needs to be more than just making recommendations to improve in those areas. So there was discovered to be a significant gap between acceptance of quote-unquote best practice recommendations and the actual ability of organizations to implement recommendations or changes internally. So from this, uh, we at CCHA determined that, you know, while it's fantastic for institutions to have their preservation needs assessed and recorded and kind of have those formal recommendations in a report, that's not the end of the process. In order for collections care and stewardship initiatives to be sustainable throughout the region, there needs to be a built-in mechanism for follow-through. So we provided guidance on what that follow through might look like through the stewardship program. We offered assistance with five different tracks for institutions to take in which through funding from William Penn, CCHA staffed people or staff people walked through and ins walked institutions through each of these areas. Tracks um, did not need to be pursued sequentially, although it is kind of important to start with that preservation needs assessment, um, but working through the tracks in this order uh, provides a systematic approach to progressive 
uh, collections care. For instance, uh, it's logical to take the findings and recommendations from a needs assessment and map them right into a preservation plan. And in fact, this two-tiered path is explicitly recommended by AAM, SAA, ALA, AIC. Um, the other tracks that follow, three, four, and five, conducting a risk assessment and refining written, various written policies and plans, um, are often actions that are explicitly recommended in the needs assessment. So institutions that pursue these tracks are kind of organically following that um, initial advice. Um, in addition to sort of those assessment tracks, the collections care training um, offered some hands-on opportunities for institutions in the region cover a range of topics, including rehousing, emergency salvage, processing basics, and many more of those hands-on um, skills that I was mentioning earlier needed to really follow through on a lot of the plans. Um, in addition to sort of all that training, we wanted to still make sure that Philadelphia area institutions were up to date with current resources. We've kept many resources online. We've worked to create many more resources, as well as maintaining an actual physical library here at CCAHA that institutions can come use as well. So this isn't exactly what the program is going to be looking like in for the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program, we're modifying it to sort of take this program on the road. So um, it will look slightly different, but I did kind of want to share the details of it um, so that you have some kind of background and understand where we're, where we're coming from. Um, and now that you know a little bit more about that program, I wanted to also share with you the impact that we've seen in the region. Obviously, we're hoping to see the same kind of positive results in your region as well. So I'm going to explore the three areas that I've listed here in particular um, and give you some sort of data to support our findings. First, I want to talk about improvements in preventative conservation. Our first source of data to show impact is from a 2009 IMLS-funded Connecting to Collections Preservation Plan for the in entire state of Pennsylvania. So we asked institutions from all over the state to answer all kinds of questions related to collections care. And then this survey gave us data and enabled us to directly compare our stewardship region against other regions of the state to see what the stewardship impact was. Um, just to show you some representative data, for one question we asked if institutions use environmental monitoring in all areas that collections are used. And across the state, we saw that 22.4% of institutions said that they do monitor the environment. But in our stewardship area, we saw a pretty good increase on that. We saw 40% actually do environmental monitoring. Um, same kind of findings here for light. Um, do you control light levels to meet specifications for your collections? 21.5 from across the state said that they control light levels, but 35% in the stewardship area do. And this one is probably the most kind of dramatic number and um, I think really good information. How many people uh, have an up-to-date preservation needs assessment and preservation plan? And um, as you can see, the stewardship area is really kind of blowing this out of the water. There's 73.7% uh, of stewardship um, participants have an up-to-date needs assessment as opposed to 17.8% in the rest of the state. And then we see the, the follow-through, 68.4% of the stewardship um, participants have been able to have an updated preservation plan. So it's really great and we can infer from that that um, the Philadelphia area, area institutions have a kind of a better understanding of their preservation needs and are including preservation planning into their overall institutional plans, which is really, really great. Um, we also saw a lot of financial um, implications as well. Participants in the Philadelphia Stewardship Program have been able to leverage their report assessments and planning documents for additional funding for preventative conservation and conservation treatment. Um, in 2009, we did interviews and sent surveys to all institutions that had participated in the program at that point, asking them how they had been able to use their planning documents to complete projects and raise money. And um, we didn't, we received 35 responses and we're pleased to see that these institutions had raised over $941,500. So this is kind of old, 
older data and um, you know not comprehensive so probably it's actually the actual number is a lot larger than that so they were really able to make use of these programs financially as well um, for further evaluation of the program we also um, did some focus groups we got some great anecdotal evidence to help uh, improve the program um, of those that participated in the program, we found that most valued the ability to leverage their participation to apply for or reallocate more funding for preservation, an overall increase in collections care and preservation programs, an overall increase in staff professionalism and development, and the development of a regional preservation community kind of what we're looking to, to do in your area as well. So given these successes, we're really um, excited about the potential to implement this program in the Eastern Gulf Coast region. Um, we really are hoping to see some of the same awesome results. So over the course of the next, it's next two years, next year and a half, um, we'll be bringing some of these ideas to you. So we'll be holding in-person workshops scheduled to be starting just about a month away in June. Um, multiple times throughout the region. Uh, some of the topics will include the things I've listed here, but um, there's, there's many more. Again, the idea is we want to provide a way to walk institutions in this region through the next steps, through how to implement and follow through with recommendations and best practices that they might have heard in the past. Um, the first set of workshops are kind of set. Um, but we are interested in hearing from you about additional topics you'd like to see covered or if you know someone with really specific regional knowledge on any of these topics, please reach out. I'd love to, to have them be involved or if you yourself happen to be an expert on any of these in the area, please let me know. Um, as I mentioned, the first two workshops are set. Uh, the first one will be in Dothan, Alabama at the Wiregrass Museum of Art on June 19th and 20th. The second one will be in Laurel, Mississippi on, uh, at the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art on June 22nd and 23rd. So big thank you to both of those host sites for agreeing to help out with this um, and their generosity. I also want to mention that both of these sites are having some really wonderful exhibition receptions while we are there for the workshop. So in addition to being very educational, I think they will be a very, they're be very fun as well. Um, the next set of workshops will be happening in the fall. I'm hoping for October, but I don't actually have any committed locations as of yet. So if you are interested in hosting a workshop or know someone who is, please um, get in touch. Or if you know someone I should reach out to, let me know. Um, I'd really like to host one of the next round of workshops in the panhandle of Florida. Since we have, we're have we visiting Alabama and Mississippi on this round, I want to make sure to include Florida on the next round. Um, so please let me know if you have any leads in that area. You can find that really detailed description of the workshops on the last um, page on our website and some more information there as well. Um, information on how to register, etc. Um, our program calendar has all this information. I've provided the direct link for you here, but you can just go to our main page and then navigate to the program calendar if that's easier. As more webinars and workshops are scheduled, this is where all the information will live about them. So um, just keep, keep that in mind for if you're trying to figure out what is happening next. We're trying to keep the pricing as low as possible. You see there, you can either do one workshop for $30 or you can do both of them for $50. Um, and we have also, um, you know, tried to schedule them in, in places that are pretty spread out from each other so that um, you can attend either one or the other. We are truly hoping everyone is able to make it. Um, we've also done the timing, so hopefully that will accommodate some of that driving that you might have to do. So as previously discussed, we'll be doing online webinars during the months we're away, and this is definitely a part that we're still developing content for. So if you have any ideas about potential topics, I'd love to hear from you again. Uh, this is also, I think, a great opportunity for us to have other content experts from the area to, you know, kind of have a shorter, little more, um, little more information on their areas of expertise. Thinking something like a southern insect expert might be able to give us really great insight into how to effectively do integrated pest management. 
um, for museums or cultural institutions, for example. So again, if you are an expert or know an expert, please send, send them my way. Um, I also mentioned that there'll be an opportunity for some select preservation needs assessment in the area throughout this program as well. Uh, a preservation needs assessment provides clear guidance for the future management of collections. It's a really important document for collecting institutions as it can help with planning um, so you know kind of where to focus your resources such as time and money. Um, basically a preservation needs assessment evaluates the policies, practices, um, environmental conditions, storage conditions, etc. of an institution with the aim of identifying factors which may have an adverse effect on the future preservation of a collection. Um, so in addition to identifying factors that may affect the preservation and future condition of a collection, this assessment also provides recommendations for the development of um, how to kind of remedy these, these issues. So institutions will be selected to receive these assessments through a grant writing process, which you will learn more about in that first set of in-person workshops. Um, and then finally, there will be a final conference in the region at the end of the program um, to, as I mentioned, really solidify what we've learned throughout the process and discuss future opportunities and sustainability of the programs that have developed. Um, we'll hear from you about your experiences with the program, what changes you've been able to implement, um, what kind of problems you've run into, as well as, once again, um, you know, fostering relationships with your neighbors to help improve the region as a whole and get everyone kind of better connected. So um, we have also been discussing the idea of doing a hands-on collections care project at a site during this conference as well, kind of like the AIC Angels program, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, we'd like to do something like, um, for example, send volunteers to a historic site to help with a housekeeping program by cleaning the site, or um, perhaps something like a housekeeping project. Um, something something along those lines. This is another aspect of the program that we're still really kind of figuring out um, at the moment and don't have all the details yet, but if you have any ideas, again, love to hear from you and stay tuned for um, more information on that. Um, so we have lots of time for questions and I already see some questions coming through in the, oops, sorry, in the um, question box over here. Um, so I will get to addressing those, but uh, I did, I have already come up with a couple of questions I've already been asked a couple of times, so I wanted to, to go ahead and answer those right away, but if you have any other questions that have come up through the presentation, please feel free to type them into that question box on your control panel, and I will get to them in just a minute. So um, the first question that we've gotten a lot is, do workshop participants need to live or work within these specific region? And the answer is no. Um, if any, if you want to attend any workshops, as long as you can get there, we're happy to have you. Um, you could have people from California if they want to fly over to Alabama to participate. We're, we're totally fine with that. Um, the caveat to that is that those um, that grant opportunity that I was mentioning, the preservation needs assessment, that will only be available to um, people in the region. Um, and also we will only be holding workshops in those regions. But as far as the webinars and um, you know actually coming to them, that's totally open to anyone who would like to like to join. Um, I've kind of already addressed the next question there. Will local collections care professionals and conservators be involved? Um, the answer there is yes, we would love for them to be involved. Um, the first set of workshops will just be taught by by me, be just for kind of cons ease of rolling out this new program, um, but for the future workshops and definitely the webinars, we are really looking to source the local knowledge, so I know there's a lot of it down there. Um, the next question, do you have to attend every workshop? For example, if you only hear about this halfway through and you miss the first two, are you going to know what's going on? Um, no, that's, that's not the case. Um, of course, we do hope that you are able to participate in as many of the program programming bits as possible, they'll give you a more complete knowledge, but it, they won't be, you don't have to do all of them to kind of know what's going on with it. Um, we are, we have been talking about kind of 
uh, recognizing the people who have participated in the whole whole program at the final conference um, and some kind of certificates but um, yeah you definitely don't have to attend every single one and the last question that we've been kind of getting frequently is what's the difference between this and other programs like um, IMLS is connecting to collections and um, the answer is that it's not really state by state it's more of a regional look at things we're trying not to be so confined by state boundaries and we want to look more at the regional way that people are dealing with these issues and some of the content will be similar to some of the content you might have um, already had in the collecting connecting to collections series um, but the way we're kind of looking at it with this regional approach as opposed to a state or city approach is is the kind of main difference there um, so I did want to open it up for questions again please let me know if you have any by typing them into the uh, question box on the side. Um, I have one question already. Um, will the slides be available to download later? And yes, we will be making the webinar available to be viewed later. Um, I still have to kind of do some finessing with the system, but we will send you guys all an email that will let you know when the slides are available for download. Um, does anybody else have any questions about the program? Give you guys just a couple minutes to type. Okay, I have a, a question in here. If um, people that work for private organizations will be eligible to attend, so nonprofit organizations or not nonprofit organizations, and um, of the the answer is yes, you will be able to attend the uh, workshops and. The webinars no problem um, we will kind of have some limitations on who is able to apply for that preservation needs assessment grant um, opportunity but that that will probably be limited to just the nonprofit organizations but um, definitely any sort of private organizations are able to participate in the other aspects um, as well Any other questions, feel free to, to write them out. All right, we have an, another question about the types of materials. Um, the Conservation Center is a paper-based lab, but do we have expertise with dealing with other objects, three-dimensional objects, um, et cetera? So uh, yes, we do have a lot of experience with other types of materials. I, I'll actually tell you guys my background is in fact a little bit more in objects, but I do have a, a strong paper background as well. So um, the, there is a big difference kind of between the, serv the conservation services that we offer here at the center and then also the um, the preservation services we offer and um, it's a little bit more we have a little bit more versatility in the uh, preservation services and the guidance we can provide there um, the another question has come in will this webinar be available afterwards to share with those who might be good candidates to participate and Definitely, yes. Um, we are still kind of figuring out the region and uh, not being from there. We're, you know, not as intimately familiar with all the regions that are out there. And we've we've tried, we've done a lot of homework um, trying to reach out to everyone, but I am sure that we have missed some. So yes, please feel free to share the information with um, anyone else that might be interested, might be around, um, and would be good candidates to participate. Will we receive a list of participants and contact info? It's another question. Um, so yes, we really are trying to Im improve that networking. Um, at most workshops we will provide, at the in-person workshops, we will provide a participant list in sort of your packet of materials so that you will know everyone who's been around. And in future webinars, we'll have sort of a more active chat function as well. So you'll be able to chat with people there in the webinars too. So that is a really good question because we are in really interested in getting that sort of networking ability in, in the region as well.
Any other final questions? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and put my contact information up on the next slide. If you think of any of any questions that might come up, please um, feel free to, to send me an email. You can give me a phone call as well. Um, we just got actually one more note to participants that there are some 19th century photographs, documents, film, AV paintings, and wooden artifact conservators in Mississippi. Um, yes, and there are lots. I know there's a wealth of knowledge um, in both in all of these regions, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. We are really excited to tap into some of those local resources. Make sure that everyone knows about what local resources are out there as well. So we'll definitely wants all of that information. And I see another note about how you guys love your history. We do too. So <laughs> we're very excited to, to help you guys share it. Okay, great. Well, I'll give you guys just one more minute here. Like I said, this is my contact information on the screen now. So please, um, if you think of something later and we're like, oh, I should have asked that, please feel free. Will the webinar link be archived is one more question. Yes, it will be archived. Um, we haven't quite uploaded it yet, but once we do, I'll make sure to send out uh, an email with the information on where it can be accessed. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, it looks like um, we're going to get out a little bit earlier today, which I think is no one is ever sad about that. So we'll um, look forward to seeing you all in June. And please uh, let me know if you have any other questions. Oh, one more question here came through. Do we need to contact our Congress people to fund NEH? Yeah, yes, please do. Um, we're definitely, as actually, we're um, going to be um, having a, a webinar on advocacy to kind of give some, give some tips and tricks about how to contact your Congress people. But yes, definitely. Um, I'm sure they will want to know that this great program is coming to their region. So please do reach out to them. All right. Also advocate for OMS and IMLS is another note, which is a good point. Yes, not all NEH, but um, well, should should just do all of them, <laughs> right? That's great. I also just got another note that senators are doing a letter by Monday the 22nd, so that will be before our um, our webinar. But um, yeah, please feel free to reach out to them and let them know that this is happening and you're excited about it and it's um, government funding for arts and culture and history and it's important to you. Okay, well, it's been great uh, getting to know everybody and I will hope, hopefully meet you all in person down in Mississippi and Alabama. The registration is live for those workshops, so please make sure to go um, get your spot. All right, thank you everyone.